your Bible this, this morning, I want you to open to a couple of places. I want you to go to the book of Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, and you can also find Matthew chapter 13. Whoop, whoop. Mark chapter 10 and Matthew 13. Um, while you're finding that, I want to see if we can put a couple of things on the screen here. I want to look at, you don't have to take time to turn there, but uh, on the screen, let's look at Luke chapter 12. I want to share something with you that's going to kind of set this up. And as far as this morning goes, I, I'm, I'm confident that what we're going to talk about in this service is exactly what the Lord has for us. Next service is another story. I, I'm not sure where we're going to go then, but if you don't like this one, there's a good chance next one will be different, so you're welcome to stay. But uh, I want you to see something Jesus said here in Luke chapter 12. Notice what happens in verse 13. It says, then one called from the crowd. One called from the crowd. So get the picture of what's going on here. Jesus had been preaching this entire chapter for the first 13 verses of this chapter. And if you were to go back and look at it, you'd find that he's saying some pretty weighty things. Some eternity altering things, as Jesus did, of course, but there's some things in these verses, some things that regardless of what camp you're from, what group you grew up in, what denomination or denominations you've been a part of, there are things in these verses that lead up to this one here that we would all agree on. Things like, um, he loves you so much that every hair of your head he has numbered. How many of you heard that one before? That was in these verses leading up to this. Jesus is saying to these people, if you were to look at it, you'd find him saying, you don't need to be afraid. You have no need to fear your father because of how much you're worth to him. He talked about the, the value of a human compared to the value of a few sparrows who fall to the ground, yet your heavenly father sees every single one of them. And he says, are you not of more value than they? He said, every hair on your head is numbered. And if you look that up, it doesn't just mean he knows how many there are. I was surprised to find this. It's actually some mathematical term, I guess, that refers to the fact that not only does he know how many, how, how many there are, if you were to pull one out, he could tell you what number it was. That's amazing, right? But then you got to stop and think, okay, great. Why? What's the point? Well, the point is, I love you beyond your ability to rationally understand it. So quit trying to figure it out with your head and grab a hold, it, a hold of it with your heart and say, thank you, I've received that. This is the kind of thing Jesus is laying down in these verses that are leading up to this. He goes on and talks about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in these people and introducing that to them and saying, don't be afraid when you're called before people. Don't even worry about what you're going to say because in that moment, the Spirit of God is going to fill your mouth and you'll know what to say. I mean, this is some weighty stuff that Jesus is laying down. Then one from the crowd called. So get the, get the picture here. Jesus is preaching, and he gets interrupted. He gets interrupted by this guy, and this guy says, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So, I won't take a whole lot of time here, but this is something I've been looking at for the last year or so. And you got to understand, and you know this and I know this, but when somebody's speaking and somebody else interrupts, whether they really intended to say this or not, what they're saying is, I hear the words that are coming out of your mouth, but they pale in comparison to the words that are in my head. So if I can go ahead and get you to shut up right now and stop what you're saying and allow me to say what I think is more important than what you're saying, that's what an interruption is. That's, that's what it is to interrupt somebody. So evidently, whatever this guy came with on his heart and in his mind, to him, far outweighed what Jesus had been saying. He interrupted and said, tell my brother to, the, to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus, in the next verse, can we look at that? Listen to what he said. Jesus replied, actually in the New King James, that new living is much friendlier. He says, friend, but in the New King James, he says, man. He said, man, who made me a judge over you? Maybe, there you did see it. Man, can you just hear it in his voice? Just sort of that irritation. I was preaching, I was saying something. Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Look at the next verse. 
He said to him, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And this whole, this whole correction to this way of thinking started with this statement, beware of covetousness. Why? Because it's sneaky. And you got to beware of it. What's covetousness? Well, we could take a long time and look at it, but it's just basically this. Wanting something too much. You can want something too much. Some things are great, but even though the thing itself is a good thing, you can want it too much. He said, take, he take heed and beware of covetousness. Why? Because your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess. Now look at it in the New Living. This verse right here, look at what he says. In the New Living, he says, Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. Can you try that with me? Say, my life, my life. is not measured by how much I own. Man, if you got a revelation of that today, you'd feel the pressure come off. You'd feel that, that need to compare yourself to somebody else and measure your life in comparison to theirs, that would just fall away. Why? Because your life is not measured by how much you own. Which also says to me, your life is not measured by how much you don't own. And your life is not measured by how much somebody else owns. And your life, here's the tricky one, your life is not measured by how much somebody else doesn't own. That's not the measure of who you are. That's not the measure of your life. How do you measure life though? Because see, to me, that's the greater revelation here. Jesus is saying, you can't measure life that way. But what I'm hearing him say is you can and should measure life. Life is measurable. When you start thinking in these terms, you're going to see this come up in Scripture over and over and over. You start looking for these measurements. Jesus said, I came that you'd have life and have it how? More what? Abundantly. That's a measurement. Abundantly is a measurement. You fill a measuring cup that measures three cups and you fill it up and then you keep filling it up. That's abundant. That's too much. That's overflow. That is a measurement. And that's the measurement of life that Jesus came to give you. What was it the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians? He said, I'd come that, I pray that you would come to know the love of Christ. What is the length and the depth and the height and the breadth? What are those things? Those are measurements. That's a measurement. Life can and should be measured. Let me ask you this morning, how much life you live in? How much life are you living? Now the danger is when you hear that question asked and immediately you turn and look at the bank account. Immediately you turn and look at the car that's in the driveway or the one that's not in the driveway. The house you're living in or the house you're not living in. But life, listen, cannot be measured in dollars. Life cannot be measured in square footage. Life cannot be measured in price per square foot. Life cannot be measured by the emblem on the hood of your car. Life cannot be measured by the brand on the clothes that are on your back. Those things do not measure your life. They can't. And if you're using those things to measure life, baby, you're using the wrong stick. Give you a quick example, illustration of this. You, st you set out on the road, you're going on a road trip. You get about 100, 200 miles down the road, and all of a sudden you got lights coming on inside that car on that dashboard and your check engine light comes on and the oil light comes on and the gas light comes on and then that little light that says you got a flat tire comes on and then lights you ain't never seen on before in your life start blinking and you think something's going wrong so what you do is check how much money you got in savings okay we're good we got a lot in savings Whew. and you keep driving you keep driving down the road and six or eight more lights come on 
and you pull over on the side of the road and instead of filling up with gas, instead of, instead of popping the hood, you pull out your wallet, okay, we've got a lot of cash, paid a lot for these jeans, glasses are designer, we should be good. Pull back out on the road and head on. This is ludicrous, right? Why? Because there are gauges on the dash of that car that are there to measure the life of that car. And if the life of that car is getting low, but you don't respond to those gauges, you respond to how much money you got, you're headed for a breakdown. We got to check and find out what gauges we've set up in life. There are gauges that will tell you how much life you're living. And we gotta change the way we think and change the way we talk about material, physical possessions. Now you know me and you know my heritage, you know my background well enough to know that I ain't standing up here preaching against prosperity. You understand that, right? As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. I'm telling you, God needs you and wants you prosperous. But before he can prosper you, he must know that you have a right relationship with money. He must know before he can put money in your hand that you're not going to take it and allow it to measure your life. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus went on and he, he told a parable at the end of that parable. He said, you're a fool. This is in that same chapter in Luke 12. He said, you're a fool. If you hoard up, lay up treasure for yourself without being rich towards God. New Living Translation says, without a rich relationship with God. I've sensed it stronger in my heart in the last several months than I ever have before. The part of my assignment and the assignment that my wife and I share together is to allow the Lord to use us to teach our generation and the ones that we come in contact with, teach us how to prosper. We must prosper. We must. For the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of the establishment of his covenant, for the sake of the people around us, for the sake of our community, for the sake of our neighbors, for the sake of our families, we must prosper. But we gotta do it his way. We must do it his way. So how do we measure life? If you were to go back and look at the Old Testament, not once, not twice, but a half a dozen times or more, you would hear God speak to his people, and he would say this particular instruction to them over and over. He would speak to them regarding what he called just and unjust scales. He talked to them about using a just scale and don't use an unjust scale. He said an unjust scale was an abomination to him. What's an unjust scale? Well, you and I know that in that particular day and time, you didn't just walk into the marketplace and buy something by stepping up to a cash register or pulling out a piece of plastic to purchase what you wanted. No, you've walked up to a set of scales, right? And you put what you wanted on one side of the scale, or I should say it like this, the, the, the guy selling you that thing, he would attribute to whatever it was you were buying, he would attribute a certain weight to that. And money was given a weight. As a matter of fact, the word shekel itself is a measurement of weight. And he would put how much that cost was, he'd put that much weight on his side of the scale. And then on your side of the scale, you start putting money on there until those scales balance, and you know you've paid what he's asking for it. But he's saying an unjust scale is one to which the merchant has added weight. You understand that, right? I mean, if he's telling you it's this amount of weight, but really it's heavier in an effort to get you to pay a little more, to cheat you out of what you've got, God calls this an abomination. But what I want you to see is that's how they added value to things. That's how they attributed value to things. What was its weight? You've heard the expression worth its weight in gold. This is where that comes from. That's because things were valued at in a measurement of weight. And God said to these people who were selling things, he said, don't add weight to this scale. That's an abomination. So I want you to think in those terms today as we talk about how we measure life I would say it to you like this, what do you give weight to? What do you give the most weight to? Again, you can see here, Jesus was preaching, 
and the things that he were saying in the scheme and in terms of eternity, these are the weightiest things there are. And this guy interrupts because what was on his mind outweighed what Jesus was saying. It was like, okay, yeah, I get it. Hair on your head, birds and sparrows. When's this guy going to shut up just long enough for me to bring my money problem? Because in his eyes, the money problem far outweighed everything else Jesus had been saying. Can I tell you something? That's an unjust scale. That's an unjust scale. We could, we could really dissect what was going on there. Tell my brother, he said, to divide the inheritance with me. So evidently, this man and his brother are in a money fight. I wonder if that still happens. I wonder if, I wonder if families are fighting over money. I wonder if church families are fighting over money. You think this might still be going on at least a little bit? Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What's that mean? They're no longer speaking. So I'm going to go get this Jesus guy to settle the argument between us. And I guarantee you what Jesus said to him was not what he came to hear. (laughs) And not what he expected to hear. In essence, what Jesus was saying to him is, man, you've given too much weight to this. What should weigh more? The love between us? Or the money between us? What are you giving more weight to? Because people, this man's given more weight to the money than he is to his own brother and the love between them. For God to increase us the way he wants to and the way he must, you and I got to begin giving weight to what he gives weight to. There are things that have been big to God that are too small to us. And things that are small to God that have been too big to us. That's an unjust scale. Man, I'm telling you right now, this is changing the way Sarah and I live our own lives personally. I'm going to get into this a little bit this morning, but not long ago, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we sat down <clears throat> making some changes in our lives and... and I'm doing some things in a different way, but we're thinking about it in these terms. We sat down and got a blank piece of paper, and at the top we put, what's most weighty? What do we need to give the most weight to? And the more you think along these lines, and the more you search the scriptures, and the more you spend time in the presence of God, the more you see money just fall down that list. I'll just be real blunt and plain with you this morning. If you make a decision based on money, Were you led by the Holy Ghost? If money led you to a place, were you led by the Holy Ghost? No, you cannot be. It can't be the Holy Ghost and anything else. Either he led you there or something else did. And if we're moving to a place or taking a job or doing a thing, because of the money effect, we're giving too much weight to it. I said we're giving too much weight to it. Did you find, uh, where did I tell you? Mark chapter 10. Okay, look at that with me. I wanna, I wanna show you this in action here. Mark chapter 10. You know that whole thing that Jesus got into with that man in Luke chapter 12. I, I so love and appreciate Jesus because he could, have, he could have ignored it. He could have gone on preaching what he was preaching. He could have just kind of called on security, I guess, and had this guy removed maybe. But you know what? He spent time with him. And he corrected him, not just for one verse, not just for two verses. If you look at it, Jesus corrected this man and this way of thinking for 20-something verses. But honestly, can I see the hands of who Jesus is correcting in that, in there? Yeah, he's correcting me. He's correcting this way of thinking in me. And that correction, can I tell you how it ended? It ended with this verse right here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. You've heard that verse. I've heard that verse. You've grown up on it. I have too. But did you ever stop and realize that it came in correction to a covetous way of thinking? It came in correction to somebody who was given too much weight to money. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Now as he, Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running 
and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit, inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Verse 21, and Jesus looking at him, here's the key right here, he loved him and said to him, one thing you lack Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Somebody say those words, treasure in heaven. You will have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. Now I want you to listen to verse 22. We're gonna put it up here and I want you to see it, but I want you to imagine for a moment, if you can, this is not a scripture. This is just me saying these words to you. And I want you to hear these words in the context of how you and I live every single day of our lives and tell me if they strike you as if at least a little funny. He went away sad at this word. He went away sorrowful, why? For he had great possessions. This man was sad because he had a lot of stuff. Now, we don't normally think in terms like that. We don't normally think in terms of having a lot of stuff and being sad, but it's possible. He was sad at this word. Other translations say his countenance fell. If you're happy and you know it, <laughs> right? Well, if you're sad, if you're depressed, you're showing it, you're wearing it. His countenance fell. He was sad at this word. He went away sorrowful, full of sorrow, for he had great possessions. Can I tell you what happened right here in this moment? This man, and I want you to hear the genuineness in his heart. I mean, he came running and found Jesus and sought Jesus out. I mean, so far, so good, right? He knelt at the feet of Jesus. So far, so good. And he very genuinely asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, right away, I want you to hear a, a problem in this. He's looking for what he can do. He's looking for what he can do. Now, one of the reasons this is, we, we know this is off and this sounds strange to us because this whole thing has taken place before the cross, which really is why Jesus responded to him in the way that he did. But he's saying, what can I do? Can you hear the pressure that's on him? What can I do to inherit eternal life? Now, right there in that statement, it's, it's, it's already all wrong because an inheritance is something that somebody else worked for and gave to you. That's what inheritance is. Inheritance is a, is a crystal clear picture of the grace of God. Something that belongs to you that somebody else worked for. Oh, come on, church. Are you listening to this this morning? Something that's yours. It belongs to you. It's been given to you, and you did not work a day for it. Your salvation, you didn't earn it, you inherited it. It's something that was given to you that Jesus worked for. Your healing is a gift he gave to you that he worked for. Your deliverance is something he gave to you and he worked for it. Not you. Not you. You didn't work for that. You didn't earn it. It's not Jesus, what can I do to inherit healing? No, it's Jesus, thank you for what you've done for my healing, for my deliverance, for my abundance, for my prosperity, for my peace, for my wholeness, for my restoration. This is the grace of God at work, what he worked for and gave to you. But again, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, you could look at every single word of this. What do you call him? Good teacher. And you could tell right away Jesus wasn't content with what he said. I think a lot of people kind of have been tripped up on what Jesus said. Why do you call me good? And I think what Jesus is saying to him here is, really, I want to know why. I want to know your definition of good because you notice he said good teacher. I think if you were to look in Matthew's account of this, you'd hear him say, good teacher, what good thing must I do? 
So he put Jesus' goodness on the same level as my goodness through my own works. Those things don't belong on the same level. See, that's why our language is so limited. I mean, we use the same word to describe so many different things. That's why you got to be watchful over what you say you love. You love your wife, man, right? But you also love your truck. And you love a good steak. Well, which is it? <laughs> you know, I hope it's not the same thing. For a lot of guys, it is. And that ain't right. It's not good. They don't belong on the same level. And all the ladies said amen, right? But I think that's what we see happening here, that there's an improper understanding of goodness and what, what is good. Good teacher, what good thing must I do? So this man came to Jesus based on his works. Jesus had to respond to him based on his works. And again, remember, this is all before our covenant's been ratified and established. He said, you know the commandments? Listed them off. And this guy's response, I've done all these things from my youth. Really? Are you sure you, you've done all these things? And I think that's why the scripture says Jesus looked at him and he loved him. There, that's the key to this whole thing right here. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. Do you know how much compassion Jesus has on those of us who have been working so hard trying to earn something from him? And he just looks at you and loves you. Almost in the sense of like, baby, that's so cute. <laughs> That is so cute. You think you can earn this. Oh, you are just this cutest little thing. Maybe you can't earn this. He looks at you and he loves you. Out of compassion, you have been killing yourself, trying to earn something from him, and he's looking at you, loving you. He looked at him and he loved him, and he said, there's one thing you lack. And here's what he said, do. Go. Sell all that you have and give it away. Come follow me. Come follow me. And, and I look at that, and I know there's a lot of ways to look at this, but I, I, even, we know that you're not, you're not gonna inherit eternal life by keeping the commandments. You know you don't inherit eternal life by giving away everything you've got. And I think Jesus is saying him, there's something you lack. Go get free Follow me, I'll show you what you're lacking. But why, why would he say, follow me? Because I'm going somewhere. This thing that you're hungry for, this, this genuine cry of your heart that's telling you there's more. You are loaded up, man. I mean, you've got money, you've got stuff, you've got houses and cars or the equivalent of in that day. He says, yeah, you got all that, but your heart's telling you there's more. I, th I think it's so beautiful that a rich man fell at the feet of Jesus knowing there was something more. Yeah. Knowing there was more to life. No, something's not measuring up, he's saying. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, come follow me and I'll show you what it is. I'm going somewhere. And when we get there, that question you have, you will get the answer to it. And in that moment, watch what happened. In that moment, an invisible set of scales got set before this man. And Jesus, on his side of the scale, gave this man something that precious few people have ever been given. Most all of us know what it is and we're familiar with at least the terminology of having a call of God on your life. But very few people have ever stood face to face with Jesus in the flesh as he gave their life purpose. As he extended to them a personal eye to eye invitation, come follow me. There was a handful of people that got it in Jesus' time. And I believe there are probably people since then who have had Jesus appear to them in one way or another. I'm not one of them. Maybe some of you are, but I bet not most of us. 
this man got something that precious few people have ever been given. His life was given meaning and purpose in that moment and Jesus put on that side of the scale the weightiness of having a call of God. The weightiness of having an invitation from Jesus to come follow him. But on the other side of that scale, that man loaded his side with how good it was to have some money. On one side, you've got the goodness of a call of God, and on the other side, you've got the goodness of having some extra cash. You've got what it feels like to be comfortable in your possessions. And to this man, what he had far outweighed what Jesus was giving. That's an unjust scale. Is it not? But he believed it. He believed that what he had outweighed what Jesus was giving. And he went away how? Sad. Sad, depressed, sorrowful. Went away sad at this. Notice not went away confident, not went away laughing, thinking, well, that man's crazy. Went away sad, probably because he knew he was wrong but he couldn't let go, couldn't let go. This is an unjust scale. Is it still happening? Is this still happening right now? In the church, all over the world, are people coming face to face and eye to eye with the call of God on their lives? Are people being given the kingdom of God and the treasure that is the kingdom of God? Is it being brought into their lives and are they not finding the value in it? Are they making decisions based on the money they have or the money they don't have, staying in one place or going to another place or leaving a place because the money's better over here? That is to set on this side of the scale. I I, I know, God, you plugged us into this church. I know we've got good relationships here. I know you saved my babies in children's church here. I know you rescued our marriage here. But this job in this other state pays $6.50 more an hour. You got the kingdom on one side of the scale and you got money on the other. That's an unjust scale. That's why if you look at, what is it, 2 Corinthians that talks about things that are seen and things that are unseen. Things that are seen are temporary. Things that are unseen are eternal. And he starts comparing uh, everything that is seen and unseen. And he says that the, the, this eternal weight of glory. You catch that? It's weighty. This eternal weight of glory is working for us a far more and exceeding uh, reward, comparing it to this light and momentary affliction. So on one side, you've got the weight of the glory, and on the other side, you've got the lightness of the affliction, the pressure that's against you. And that would include financial pressure, would it not? This is the passage of scripture where he talked about being hard pressed on every side. And on one side, you've got, you've got the pressure that's against you. And on the other side, you've got the glory that's within you. Give more weight to the glory. Give weight to it. How do you do that? You do that in, with your words. You do that with your heart. You do that with, with your thinking and your thoughts. And you don't allow thoughts to come in and tell you that what's against you outweighs what's in you. No, greater is what's in you than what's against you. What's in you far outweighs what's against you. But here you see a man that missed the whole call of God on his life. I've heard my grandfather preach on this and he says, I'm convinced of this. I can't prove it, but you can't prove it's not true. One of those. He said, I'm convinced this was Judas' replacement. Now, Jesus goes on in this passage of Scripture, the same one we're here in Mark chapter 10. And he says in verse 29, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. You hear that? My sake and the gospels. 
Jesus just gave you and me the only right motivation for anything we ever do for the rest of our lives. What's the motivation for your move? Jesus' sake and the gospels. What's the motivation for your words? Jesus' sake and the gospels. What's the motivation for going to this church? Jesus' sake and the gospels. Hey, listen to me, young people, single people. What's the motivation for the relationship? Jesus' sake and the gospels. Can I tell you why I married this beautiful woman here on this front row? I loved, did I love her? Absolutely. Do I love her now? Absolutely. But for the first time in my life, I got into a relationship for Jesus' sake and the gospels. And she's hot. Yes, that's true. But (laughs) for Jesus' sake and the gospels. He's handing you, he's handing us our motivation for living. And he said, nobody has left all this stuff. Nobody, I'd say it like this, has gone all in for my sake in the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold now in this lifetime. So see, he was talking to this young man, this rich young ruler, about treasure in heaven. Did he not say that? He said, you, you sell everything, you give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. And the reason that he didn't buy into this was because he was comparing a treasure that he could see with a treasure he couldn't see. But here's what you gotta understand about treasure in heaven. It's not just something that's waiting for you when you get there. You can have part of your treasure in heaven now. Isn't this what he's saying? No man has gone all in for my sake that he will not receive in this lifetime. It's just a matter of what bank you're drawing it out of. So we see here somebody that obviously got it wrong, but I want to show you somebody that gets it right. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 44. Jesus says in verse 44 here, Matthew 13, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure. Somebody say treasure. It's treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid and for joy over it goes and what? What's he do? Sells how much? How much? How much? He sells all. He sells all he has and buys that field. Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So whenever he says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, you need to be ready to to see this in two different ways. Number one, evidently he's saying here that the kingdom of God, and not just the kingdom of God, but our place in it, our place in the kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field. And a man working in this field comes across this treasure. And for the joy over it, what do he say? The joy? Can you see how polar opposite this is to the man we just read about? Who was given the kingdom, handed the kingdom of God, given a place in it, and he went away sad. But here you've got somebody that's been given the exact same thing. And for the joy over it, sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, we'll get into this, and yes, this should be our response, but where do we get the motivation to respond to the kingdom of God like this? It only comes when you realize that this man in the field isn't just you. This is the whole operation of the kingdom of God. This is what God did for you. He was the man in the field. And there's treasure in you. And he got so ballistically joyful over the treasure that he put in you, he sold all that he had. When he gave Jesus, that was everything he had. And he bought you. And when you get a revelation of that, this becomes your response. Now this man just working in this field, comes across a treasure. 
and for the joy over it. Man, that's been going off inside of me these last few weeks. The joy over it. The joy over it. Why would somebody get in joy over something that they found? Because they know how much it's worth. If you have no idea how much a thing is worth, you got no joy over it. As far as you're concerned, it's just another thing. Recently, I was reading an article. Uh, it was in Time Magazine. I think it was written back in 2012. Pastor Aaron, you probably heard about this. There was a guy in Defiance, Ohio, who was one of, I think, 20 nieces and nephews uh, to, to an aunt who had just passed away and he was put in charge of cleaning out her house. So they're going through the whole house and, and uh, she had lived there whole, her whole life. Before that, his grandfather had lived in this house. So this house had been in their family for I think well over a century. And so a lot of stuff gets accumulated in that time. And he's in the attic cleaning this place out. And one, I guess the other cousins or something, brought a box to him and said, hey, I found this. He opens this green box said it was packed with twine, started looking through it and found some, what looked like old baseball cards. And uh, the article said that he kind of looked at it for a minute, recognized that they were old, but with so much still to do in the house, just sort of put it aside. He set that box on a dresser in the house and sat there for two weeks. And then uh, after that, he moved it over to, I guess, his desk or something and started going through it. And then he started recognizing the names of these players on these cards. And then he realized there were 700 baseball cards in this box. There were Ty Cobb cards. There were Cy Young cards. There were Connie Mack cards. Some of these names might, might not be that familiar to you. There was a Honus Wagner card. Um, Honus Wagner played professional baseball from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, 20 something years, and was considered for decades to be the greatest player that ever lived. Ty Cobb called Honus Wagner the greatest shortstop ever. As a matter of fact, some of these guys were the initial inductees to the Baseball Hall of Fame when it opened in 1937. So he starts recognizing some of the names on these cards and he thinks to himself, this might actually be worth something. He took it to some memorabilia experts who then had the whole collection authenticated, this collection was instantly given a value of over $3 million. They rate baseball cards from one to 10, 10 being mint and pristine condition. This Honus Wagner card and every card in that collection was given an unheard of 10. Talk about finding a treasure. Just, just digging in an attic and finding a treasure. I can only imagine the joy <laughs> over the treasure that they found. Experts said that this will be the sports collection that all others from here out will be compared to. No find has ever been like this one. But the part that caught my attention was the fact that this thing sat on a dresser for two weeks, even after he found it. That says to me that you can have something in your hand and have no idea what it's worth. I mean, if you knew instantly it was worth $3 million, you'd move it like he did eventually to a bank vault and not let it sit on a dresser for two weeks. But here is a problem. God's brought people into your life. God's brought a church into your life. God's brought his word into your life. God's brought revelation into your life. But if you don't know how much it's worth, he's given you a call. He's given you an assignment. And it's a treasure. But if you don't know what it's worth, you'll never get in joy over it. And you will certainly never sell all that you have to have it. This is what came up in my heart this morning. There's opportunity coming. And I believe this by the word of the Lord. 
There's opportunity coming to you and to me. There's opportunity coming for you and I to go all in. I'm going to tell you this story. Sarah and I started our ministry, it'll be five years ago this September. And for almost that entire time, we've been looking for land. We've been looking for a building. We've been looking for a place for our ministry to set up and call home. And man, we looked and we looked and we looked. And at one point we thought we would be moving to Colorado. So we're looking in Colorado. We're looking at land out there. We're looking at buildings and homes and things out there. And we are looking and looking. And I would say for, for four years we looked. And knowing that God had a place for us, this is a good thing, right? A place for your ministry. This is a good thing. But you remember what I said to you a few moments ago? That it's possible to want something too much. And we looked and we looked and we looked and I'm almost ashamed to say that I spent time that I should have been sleeping online, on real estate websites, looking all over the place. Why? Because I wanted this. Somehow, somewhere along the line in my thinking, having ministry land or a building became the measure of my life and the measure of our ministry. And buildings can't measure a ministry. The only thing we knew was that Sarah and I would sit in services and we would hear my grandfather and it seemed like he did it more and more over the last few years than he ever had before. He would tell the story about how he and my grandmother acquired their ministry property. And it seemed like he would walk over and stand right in front of me and Sarah and tell this story. And the whole time he'd tell it, we're sitting there just poking each other, elbowing each other, go, this is it, this is how we'll know. Because we'd wondered, how are you gonna know when you find the place? And he would tell the story, and the story goes that he found this land, the land that they're on now, and he went and found the old man who owned the land, and my grandfather didn't have money to buy, but he sat across from this old man and said, the Lord has need of your property. And the old man looked back at him and said, well, it's for sale. And my grandfather would say, well, sir, I don't borrow money. He said they sat there in silence for 10 minutes. Then the old man, Mr. Pruitt, looked back at him and said, well, come back and see me. So my grandfather would leave, come back sometime later. Lord has need of this property. It's for sale. I don't borrow money. Silence. And this would happen, I think, at least two more times. Until finally one day, My grandfather went back to see him and Mr. Pruitt said, here's what I'd like to do. You said you don't borrow money. So I'm going to divide my property into four sections. And I'm gonna allow you to lease from me one section at a time. But when your lease is all paid up, I'm going to deed you that section of the property. Would you agree to that? And my grandfather said, yes, sir, I would agree to that. And he said, now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to give you the first section of this property. And Sarah and I would sit there and go, that's how we'll know. That's how we'll know. There'll be that kind of favor on it. And, and, and we'll see it and we'll know it because the favor of God will be all over it. And then what would we do? I'd go out, I'd get online, and I'd start looking. As though the testimony of the, the, our ministry property was going to be, hey, look what I found online. And I had so worn myself out looking that I went before the Lord sometime about this time last year, about the fall of last year, and said, sir, I I repent. I know you want us to have this, but I know it's not to be at the expense of my joy, the expense of my peace. Those things far outweigh ministry, property and buildings and lands. So I'm going to rest and let your grace supply it. Can I tell you, it wasn't a month later that I got a call from a partner of ours who had read a letter that I had written talking about some exciting things we were getting ready to do in our ministry and getting ready to take this step of faith. He said, what's going on with you guys? And we said, hey man, we're just believing God for our new property. He said, well, what are you looking for? I said, all I know is we're supposed to be taking steps towards a television ministry. That's the assignment the Lord's given us is to to preach Jesus uh, on television. That's all I know. 
He said, well, have you thought about this guy? And it was a guy I knew that used to work for my grandfather in my grandfather's TV ministry, who I hadn't talked to in years. And he said, you know, he's got these buildings and this TV studio, and I think he's in transition or something. You should just give him a call. So I ended up calling the guy and I called him said, hey man, can I just ask about what's going on with y'all and, and what you got going on? And he said, this is crazy that you're calling me because just this week, my wife and I, for the first time, started talking about the potential of selling or leasing our buildings. He said, come out and just take a look and see. We don't know what we want to do. I said, okay. So we went out, we sat down with him, we looked around the place, got a fully functioning TV studio in it. And they said, you know, we know something's up, but we don't know what we're I said, well, you guys just seek the Lord and, and find out what he wants you to do with this. I think a couple of weeks later, we went back out and met with them. They put all these options in front of us, like eight or nine different pieces of paper. And we kind of went through all of that. And then we got to the end of it and they looked at us and they said, but here's what we've sought the Lord and believe he's saying to us. We believe this place is yours. So what we want to do is divide it into four sections. And if you want to, you can buy a section from us or you can lease it if you want. And what we'll do is we'll just make 100% of your lease payments go towards the purchase price. And after you buy a section, we'll just, or after you lease a section, we'll just deed it to you. And they said, but what the Lord told us to do was to give you this fourth section. Sarah and I, big tears fill up in our eyes. They're like, wait, what's wrong? And we said, have you never heard Papa's story? We told him the story we just told you. And he said, I worked for that man for seven years and never heard that story. Now here's what's interesting about this whole thing. We, we were able to, by the grace of God, pay cash for that first section of the property. And you know what we bought? A big, empty metal building sitting on a piece of dirt with a pretty rough neighborhood on this side of the driveway, a bunch of old metal worn out buildings around us. And I guarantee you, if you were to drive down the dirt gravel road that you'd have to drive down to come see our place, you'd look at that and you'd say, you went all in for this? <laughs> because that's just about what we did. We just about emptied out for this thing but we did it with so much joy. We did it with so much peace. Why? Because we saw a treasure in that field. The treasure was that this place enabled us to do what God called us to do. And like that man standing out there in that field who found that treasure and went so nuts over it that he went and sold everything that he had why because he when he saw the treasure he recognized it for what it was he recognized it as something that was worth everything he had and more this is the place we must come to with the call of God on our lives when you come eye to eye with your heavenly treasure the assignment on your life folks there's opportunity coming for you to go all in. And it, there may be only one or two times in our whole lifetime that we get opportunity to empty everything we've got and put it all into the kingdom of God, put it all into what he's called us to do, put it all into his, his, his assignment on our lives, but don't pass that opportunity by when it comes to you. And don't look at what you've got as though it's all you'll ever have. When you see the kingdom of God and your place in it, be quick to recognize, I got a $3 million box of baseball cards sitting on my lap. What if somebody told you you could have bought that house and everything in it for the price of the house? And what if they said that house? Well, this house is a, is a $300,000 house. But you can have everything in it. And you look at the account and you think, well, that's all I got. Would you not with great joy give everything you've got? Because buried within it is the ability to not only replace what you had and give you so much more. 
Oh, come on, everybody. This is the treasure we've been given. This is what it is to find your calling. This is what it is to recognize what he's given you and graced you to do. This is it right here. And I'm going all in. Now, here's what I want to say before Sarah ministers this to us. There is an opportunity coming. I don't know when it is. I don't know if it's this year or 10 years. I'm just telling you from this day forward, watch for it. There's an opportunity for you to go all in financially. I just want this to be clear. I'm talking to you about your money. It's an opportunity for you to say to the Lord, though, your things and your kingdom far outweigh every dime to my name. So watch for that day. But until that day comes, this is the day you're in right now. And you can go all in with your heart. Because where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be. Where your heart is, your treasure's going to be there. You guys are sitting in a world-changing church. Go all in. Get in this thing with your heart. Give everything you are from the inside out. And there will be an opportunity. I guarantee it. Pastor Aaron will stand on this platform one day and say, I have met with Jesus. And this is what he's telling us to do. And I'm looking for somebody who will jump on board. And because you're all in with your heart, it will be the easiest thing you've ever done to say, I'm going all in with everything I've got.